Welcome to the Connors Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. 50 years ago were the anniversary of the 69 Mets, and, and I remember a trade that built up where the, the Mets traded a fairly good utility infielder, Bob Johnson, to the Cincinnati Reds for our guest right now, Art Shamsky. Welcome to Connors Corner. My pleasure, Mike. So when, when, when you traded, what did it feel like? Like you were going to a losing team at that point. Yeah, I came up with the Cincinnati Reds, and um, my first year in the minor leagues, I played with to- uh, Tony Perez and Pete Rose and and um, came up with a lot of good young players and actually was the prelude to the Big Red Machine in the, in the mid-'70s. And, and when I first got traded, it was a little bit of a shock. Uh, you know, you, you're leaving friends that you've known is basically when you're 18 years old, and, and, then, and the first time is always uh, it's a little bit of a of a, like I said, a shock. And then of course I heard it was to the Mets and wasn't crazy about New York at the time. And the Mets were just an awful team and you didn't win two out of three against them in a series or, or didn't win the whole series, sweep them in three games. There was something wrong. So, so that was a little bit of a shock, but when I got here and made new friends and, and of course, two years later, after I got here, we won the world series and I've been in New York ever since. So funny how life works at times. Yes, it is. Now, when you were, when we, the Mets traded for you. We were hoping you're going to be a big home run hitter because you had one very good year in Cincinnati as far as hitting home runs. Yeah, I hit the. Um, it was the best ratio in the big leagues. Twenty, I think it was twenty one and only two hundred and thirty at bats. But I didn't stay healthy, and that's the that's the problem. You have to stay healthy. But I, there's a story behind that too. My good friend Eddie Cranepool always says that when he heard they made a trade with the Cincinnati Reds, he thought it was for Pete Rose, and then he heard about it was me, and he was been has been disappointed ever since. So uh, <laughs> what is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think they could have gotten Pete Rose for Bob Johnson, but, you know, he's... No, I don't think so. All right, so you're, you're playing with the Mets. When did things start turning around in your mind playing for them? I, I think it actually started when Gil Hodges was named manager. Uh, my first year was 68, and that was his first year as manager, along with, you know, Tommy Agee and uh, Al Weiss, uh, J.C. Martin. A few of the guys came on come on the team in, uh, in 68, and... and um, and Gil was really the, the glue that the, this team needed. I remember the first day of spring training in 1968, he had a meeting and he said, uh, I want you guys to know that you will not be the same old Mets that everybody knows. And right off the bat, I knew he was going to be a tough, strong disciplinarian. And, and even though we didn't play that much better in 68, you could see the signs were changing. We had great pitching, all those young pitchers and good defense and we just didn't know how to win close games. We we would blow games two to one, three to two, games that you normally could win at least most of them, and and so you knew things were on the rise. And then in the spring of '69, uh, still nobody thought we were going to go on to win a World Series. But I remember he gathered everybody around and he said, "You know something? You guys are better than what you think." And he started to make us believe. And even though we started out and not great in '69, we did have a couple streaks where we won some games, but. Really, it wasn't until the middle of the season, particularly in August, when when we really started to play well. We were still nine games behind the Cubs in the National League East, and all of a sudden we started winning every game, every series. Everybody contributed. uh, Guys uh, at the end of the bench who came off the bench did things to help us win. And from that point on, we were unbeatable. We were a terrific team, and we swept a, a really good Atlanta Braves team in the playoffs. And then, of course, we beat an incredibly talented Baltimore Oriole team that won 109 games in a regular season in the World Series. So we were a team to be reckoned with. But I really believe it started when Gil Hodges was named manager. And I think they would have won more World Series, or we would have won more World Series if Gil would have lived longer, too. He passed away at, at the age of 47 and never really got a chance to really get started and really continue that legacy of his. Going back to year year in 1969, you hit 300. And some of the people around today, hitting 300 in 1969 was a much greater accomplishment than hitting 300 in most of baseball history, especially the last few years. Well, um, you know, I don't know about that. It was a, it was always a challenge in those years. You know, one of the things that, that I always get uh, asked is, don't you wish you were playing now? And, of course, I say, well, of course I would like to be making the money they make, but the reality of it is I wouldn't change it for that World Series ring I have in 69. And the other thing I think is really important, which relates to what you say, I got a, I got a chance to play with and against, I think, the greatest conglomerate of players in the history of the game. Just in the National League, where I played most of my career, you had Mays, Aaron Clemente, Billy Williams, Willie Stargell, Willie McCovey, Joe Torrey, Johnny Bench, Pete Rose, Tony Perez. I mean, the list goes on and on. But in particular, the pitchers I faced 
in that era, the Colfax, Drysdale, uh, Don Sutton, Marichelle Perry, Fergie Jenkins, Tom Seaver, um, who I played against when I, before I came over to the Mets, uh, Bob Gibson, uh, Steve Carlton. I mean, the list goes on and on of great pitchers. So uh, in, in reality, I, I, I agree with you. It was really tough to, to hit for, for a high percentage back in those days. But um, the fact is I wouldn't change it having had a the thrill to play against those guys and with some of those guys. When I came up to Cincinnati, the, the team had Frank Robinson in right field, Veda Pinson, um, Tommy Harper was in left field. I mean, a lot of great players on that Cincinnati team. So for me, I got a chance to play with and, and against some of the greatest players in the history of the game. Just as an aside, who do you think was the greatest player? And I know it's very tough, but who was the greatest player you played with and who was the greatest player you played against, in your opinion? Well, the greatest player I probably played with would be, you know, right up there with uh, – with separate of pitchers uh, because you have to put Seaver up there. But uh, Frank Robinson, I played with at Cincinnati. He was a tremendous home run hitter and a very tough, tough guy. And then you have to put Rose in there who had more hits than anybody in the history of the game. So those two guys right off the bat and against, I mean, how do you find anybody better than Willie Mays? And then you'd go to Pittsburgh and you'd see Clemente and say, who's better than him. And then you go to Atlanta and say, who's better than Aaron. So I had the best of both worlds and, um, power hitters and, and just wonderful baseball hitters to look at. And I used to go up to the batting cage and watch batting practice, uh, guys that I thought were really great hitters and watch them and, and learn from them. But it was, for me, a real thrill to be in that era of baseball because I think if you look at the Hall of Fame inductees over the years, that era had so many great players. And, again, I'm really happy that I got a chance to play with and against them. Getting back to the 1969 season, okay, I think around September 24th, you guys clinched the division. When, in your mind, you say, hey, we're going to win this division? Well, it was pretty close to that. The Cubs were still, you know, you know, still a tough team. Um, we were nine games behind them in the middle of August and then finished up nine, nine or ten games ahead of them. So we were just, we, you know, we were such a, a tough team back then because we had – you know, on the pitching staff, we had Seaver and Kuzman and Gentry, and then Ryan would spot start and Tug McGraw and, and Jim McAndrew, and we had a terrific pitching staff. But a thing people really tend to forget is that we had a great defensive ball club. Jerry Grody behind the plate was the best catcher I played with and against, and Bud Harrelson at short, Boswell Weiss at second, and Tommy Agee in center field. So we, we knew that we were going to be in close games all the time. As I mentioned before, it was really a matter of finding ways to win those close games that we had normally had found ways to lose. And and I uh, I guess to, to answer your question, once about the third or towards the end of August, I knew that we were a team to rec- be reckoned with. We were still behind the Cubs. We still had to make up ground. But once we got into September, I don't think there was a better team in baseball. I mean, I I, I really believe that. And 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 of course, Baltimore won 109 games that year in the American League. But but um, we lost the first game in the World Series, and and I don't think anybody felt like we were going to get uh, beat in four games in a row. I mean, we had Kuzman pitching the next day, and he pitched a great game. So we were we were as competitive as anybody in baseball. But I know that was a long-winded answer for your question. But I think for me, it was basically towards the end of August when I saw that we were winning. Almost every game we were playing, and I knew then we were had a team to be reckoned with. And still, you don't believe you're going to win a division. We had never won anything as the Mets. We had never even been at more than 500 at one point in that season. And so it was all new for all of us. But I think everybody was gaining with confidence. And Gil Hodges was a terrific manager and got everybody involved on the team. And, and I think that was his greatest asset because he knew that he needed everybody on that team to, to, to play their best. And he got that that year. World Series. What was it like to be in the World Series? And I know Gil Hodges platooned. Did you agree with him on, on, on his platooning? Uh, I didn't like it. Nobody liked it. Uh, it wasn't great for your career. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. You. I had a great. I'll give you a perfect example. I had a great playoffs against Atlanta. This is, uh, seven hits and thirteen at bats, and we sweep Atlanta. And then we, I don't start the first game of the World Series, which was disappointing. But but he did send me up to pinch hit in the uh, in the ninth inning um, of that game. But. But um, you would talk to anybody on that team, in particular myself and Ron Sabota, who shared right field. And collectively, we had a pretty good year, lots of home runs and lots of RBIs. But but we didn't like it because it really wasn't it wasn't something that that you 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 liked and, and was good for your, your like I said your career. But but it was working, and so we we tolerated. It. And Gil was a guy that would would be honest with you and tell you, will look you in the eye and say, this is the reason I'm doing it. So we accepted it. And he also platooned at first base and second base and third base and sometimes behind the plate. So 
you had a lot of guys in the moving parts, but but I don't think anybody really liked it because you you just couldn't get into a groove and you just couldn't put up the numbers. You know, the, the, those are the things that they we weren't allowed agents back in those days, and those were the things that they would hold against you. And you'd say, well, I hit so many home runs and this and that. And well, remember that game back in the September? You didn't start, and that's what they would say to you. And so you it was it was difficult but again it was working and so we accepted it because Gil was such a great manager all right now you have a book out after the miracle what's it about it's about uh, the relationships and the camaraderie uh, of the team and how we stuck together over 50 years and we've lost 10 I think it's 10 members of that team including coaches manager and players and and the nucleus is still there, but it's really about the relationships that developed from, you know, the, the losing teams at the Mets until we won the World Series. And then 50 years later, how we're still friends and the camaraderie, camaraderie is still there. We made a trip out to California to visit with Tom Seaver. And really, the, the book starts out with this trip, but putting it together and sitting down with him at a time when we all knew that he wasn't 100% and wasn't going to do, be doing much traveling at that point. And we were lucky to get him on a good day. We talked for about eight or nine hours and took out three other uh, teammates of mine, Bud Harrelson, Ron Sabota, and Jerry Kuzman. And we went out and we really had a wonderful time reminiscing and talking about the year and how important it was for all of us who were part of that team. And, and it was just a great day. And, and, and it was just, uh, I think, for Buddy Harrelson, who had announced that he was in early stages of Alzheimer's and, and Tom, who's had Lyme disease for over 20 years, who's had some problems with his health. Those guys were friends and roommates. And, uh, and during the season, it was just uh, it was just therapeutic, I think, to, for all of us to get together. And that's really what the book is about, this camaraderie and, and love for each other and also about aging. You know, aging is a is a process we're all going through and it talks about um, growing older and and still remaining friends and i think people who read it will really enjoy it it's not the it's not the everyday book that uh, has been written about that team there's been so many books written about the 1969 mets and the met organization and we uh, eric sherman who co-wrote the book with me we decided we wanted to just write something that fans could relate to something sentimental something that that uh, that they would understand how close we were and that was really the, the 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 whole crux of the book so you you're trying to get along not really it's not really about the baseball seasons it's what you guys did after your careers and how you you kept in touch well, yeah it's probably about what happened afterwards but it's you know there's some game stuff yeah everybody wants to know about the black cat incident that <laughs> year and the, and the shoe polish incident in the world series and and uh, you know the no hitter pitch against us and Tom Seaver's almost perfect game and the game where we won against the Cardinals where Steve Carlton struck out 19 but we still yeah. beat him. I mean those are all part of the story. You can't get away from it. But there've been so many books that have been just talk about everyday games and stuff like that. We wanted to get a little more human interest in this and talk about the, the relationships we had as players that have remained strong over the years and as we get into this 50th anniversary they still remain strong and even though we we've lost a number of players on that team and coaches and manager it's still a team that that spends time together and and and, and it's it's one of the most iconic teams i believe in the history of baseball i i know that's hard for many people to believe because they look at it and say hey you guys weren't the greatest team ever to win a world series and, and i agree with them but in the history of baseball, it'll show that that team was one of the most iconic and well-known teams. And what? How many teams 50 years later would they would they celebrate like we're celebrating? I mean, the things that we're doing, uh, all, all the, the, the 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 personal appearances and and um, all the things that are going to happen this year, and, and you just can't do that with every every team that wins a World Series. So. I think that team is very, very special. It is. And, and you guys, you know, the end of August, September, October, you might have been the greatest baseball team of all time for those couple of months. Your pitchings didn't give up home runs. <laughs> well, I, I do believe there was a stat that uh, I think it was 15 or 16 games um, uh, in that period of time towards the end of the season where uh, Seaver and Kuzman only lost one game in 15 or 16 starts somewhere like around that. So that's a pretty good indication of our one, two uh, pitching uh, staff. And, and then you throw in Gentry and Nolan Ryan and McGraw and, and Jim um, McAndrew, you would have, uh, you would have a, a lot of, uh, a lot of people uh, thinking that team was one of the best teams ever. And, and even though uh, Baltimore won nine more games during the regular season than we did, everybody uh, didn't get, nobody gave us a chance in the world series. And, 
and I have the distinction of making the last out of the only game we lost in the World Series, but even after we lost it, nobody thought to we were, in our team anyway, thought we were going to lose four in a row. We had Kuzman the next day, and, and he pitched a great game, and we come back one and one, and then we win the next three, so the rest is history. Art Shamsky, thank you for the memories. The book, After the Miracle, thank you again for your memories. Uh, uh, you know, us old Met fans will never forget you guys. Uh, thank you so much. It's great to, to be remembered in that way. It was a great team, great guys, and uh, and uh, I think the, the 16 Mets will live on for another 50 years. Right. Buy the book, After the Miracle, by Arch Shamsky.